I, um, I guess I wanted to talk uh, more specifically about some of the things that Tony's been talking about, in particular where we are in terms of the legacy of water resource development, in particular the environmental costs and the future management of rivers and the potential environmental benefits. I wanted to start, I guess, with a few myths in terms of Murray-Darling Basin rivers. And one of those is that rivers uh, have always dried up and um, nothing's changed. And salinity and blue-green algal blooms are not increasing. They're just part of the river basin. Now, both of those are true in the sense they've always been there, but they have been increasing. We just need a good flood to fix the system. No, I'm sorry, that won't happen. And one issue that's been out there is that the lower lakes problem will go away if the barrages are removed. Again, this is not an easy solution to the problem. And I guess the big one is we, this debate is being uh, given as a, an environment versus basin communities debate. And I would argue that that's not the way we should be looking at it. We should be looking at how we go forward together so I just wanted to start off, and I know a, a lot of you are, um, know about rivers, but maybe not all of you know what the irrigation effect of developing river systems is, but when you put a dam in a river system, uh, it changes the way the flows uh, operate. So once you start irrigating from that system, and we have about 95% of our water use in the Murray-Darling is for irrigation, uh, you change the nature of flows. And we've also developed uh, floodplain levee banks in our wetlands, which control the way our rivers. And inevitably, we get less flooding, less overbank flows, less water for floodplains, groundwater, dependent organism, and of course, lots of people who uh, get their income from floodplains. In terms of, of river regulation, if you think about a particular catchment, and on, on the y-axis, you've got their environmental flow in percentage compared to natural, and you'll see there's a line, dotted line across the top, from the top of the catchment to the bottom of the catchment. And if you then regulate a river system uh, from an environment point of view, there's a dam in the top, and the percentage of environmental flow declines as you go down towards the bottom of that catchment. And really, the critical thing is where are the extraction points? And I, I get a sense that, that um, it's actually quite a difficult issue for many people to get their heads around, but a very important one. <clears throat> one of the other parts of this story are that um, we're a very, very dry continent, and if you look at how much water we use as a percentage across the river basins, the 12 major river basins in Australia, um, clearly the issue um, is, is stark in terms of the Murray-Darling and how much we use in, in the Murray-Darling Basin. And in particular, I think it's important from an environment point of view that there's been a 65% increase in water use fairly recently. That means we haven't necessarily seen the full effects of uh, this development. Um, some of you will have seen this figure from CSIRO, but it shows a relative estimate of the amount of water in each of the rivers. So you can see clearly the Murray's got most of the water. The other part of this story is how we've regulated in, in our river systems in terms of building dams. And we have about 30,000 gigalitres of storage capacity, about 130% of the average flow in this system. So it's a highly regulated river system. And that's allowed us to divert water, and we've seen a decline in that amount of water that we've diverted, um, uh, mainly because of the drought, but also things, policy instruments like the cap. And this has had a major effect on the, major, the, the large wetland systems we have around the Murray-Darling. And whichever river system you go to, there are significant impacts uh, occurring on those floodplain ecosystems from the southern part of the Murray-Darling Basin right up to the northern part and the more recently developed river systems uh, such as the Condamine Ballon. There are two critical effects that go on here, one of which is that um, some systems get too much water, and, and, and a real, really good example of that is the Menindee Lakes. Um, you may not have seen, this is a, a photograph of Menindee Lake in the 1950s, and it's a very complex wetland system. We know it's highly biodiverse compared to other ones that we've uh, seen around the place. And then today, 
uh, it looks very stark in terms of the dead trees and not a lot of life in it. And I particularly like using this, this uh, example because here we have the Premier Conservation Agency in New South Wales has decided to make a poster of probably one of the worst examples of environmental degradation. And it does cut to the quick uh, in terms of people's understanding of the river issue from an environment point of view. Uh, the area that I've been doing a lot of work on is the Macquarie Marshes, and it's one of these places that's uh, certainly been affected in terms of uh, impacts to river flows. Uh, it's a major wetland system. Uh, water flows from, from south to north, and we have an area that's uh, maybe 20 kilometres by 80 to 100 kilometres uh, in dimension. There are parts of a nature reserve there, but most of this area is actually owned by floodplain graziers. Uh, the um, Commonwealth Government has um, admitted that there's a likely change to the ecological character of this system. We've seen more water come into this uh, river system for environment in uh, up to 260,000 megalitres a year. Now, if you look at how flows have changed in this particular system at Warren, which is um, upstream of the marshes, you can get a sense of the ups and downs, the 50s of the floods, the 70s of the floods, without river regulation. What would we have got if we, if we had the original, compared to the impacts currently? And there are significant impacts in this system. And that's being uh, affected in ways that we can then show in terms of the flooding patterns, what would a flood uh, have looked under a regulated system compared to an unregulated system? You can start to measure the distribution of that flooding across the landscape. There are other major ecological changes. We've got large areas of, of dead red gums, decreasing flood frequency, so the blue bits up there are, are places that flood frequently, and parts are getting more yellow than they are blue. Uh, but we're seeing other changes in this system, contracting reed beds, and we're also seeing, funnily enough, uh, changing woodland bird communities from uh, a wetter area with, with honey eaters and so on into a, a drier system. Water bird story is also one of those that's uh, indicated we've got some major changes going on. We've been doing aerial surveys, the top third of the Macquarie marshes for some time, and numbers of species have declined, and this is a log scale on the y-axis, so it go goes up to 100,000 and you'll see that we've had a significant decline over time, started to bounce back last year uh, during the floods. Perhaps one of the most serious issues, given the Macquarie Marshes, is probably one of our premier, if not the premier, site for breeding water birds. Uh, we have had breeding in this system about every two years, but a period until recently of 10 years without breeding. Significant impacts on long-term changes. But it's not all about flow. So uh, there are some changes in this system where, if you like, the, the flows are being interrupted by different structures that are in the floodplain. So you can think of a system that's highly regulated. There are a number of off-river off storages that are changing water. There are levee banks. There are channels, all of which in some way are changing the flow regimes in these systems. Um, and because the water's got to come through a lot of those, it's very challenging in terms of long-term change. 